children have not left yet, you may be dismissed now for Children's Church. The rest of us, you could turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 4, probably on page 4 or 5 for most of you guys. We are going to study chapter 4 and chapter 5 today. So this is the third sermon in our Genesis series that will take us all the way up to Easter. So that is the next three months, Brenda. And uh, then we'll do a few, uh, you know, uh, Palm Sunday, Good Friday, and Easter. And then we'll pick Genesis back up until the summer. Ephesians, the rest of Genesis, uh, and then back to Thanksgiving and Christmas. So that's our calendar for the year. This is the third sermon. And what we've learned so far in Genesis is that in Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2, at creation, God is creating the world as a place for his kingdom. God creates the world to establish his kingdom on earth. And don't miss it. The establishment of God's kingdom is for God's glory and for our joy. We learn in Genesis chapter 3 that there is an alternative to God's kingdom. We see a snake who slithers into God's kingdom and seeks to usurp that kingdom by causing God's people to doubt God's goodness and his great, great power. In this sermon, we are going to see war between the kingdoms. Sin, no matter how small we think it is, no matter how big we think it is, is war against God's kingdom. So my hope today in this sermon is that I would do two things. I would show you the seriousness of sin. It's serious. It's extensive. You can't contain it. It spreads. That is its DNA. Therefore, run from it. But perhaps more motivating, absolutely more motivating, my hope is that I would show you the greatness and goodness of our God to sinners. And that would motivate you to run from sin and to savor our great God. So that's what we're doing today. We're talking about war between the kingdom to motivate us to savor and enjoy our God, the true God of the kingdom. So let's read. We'll start. We're going to take this piece by piece like we've been doing in our uh, Genesis sermon so far. We're going to read verses 1 through 5. So the perfect word of our God says to us in Genesis 4, starting in verse 1, Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again, she bore his, his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of the sheep and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry and his face fell. The first thing we're learning in these verses is we're introduced to the sons of the woman, the sons of Eve. We're introduced to Cain and Abel and their sacrifices. Now notice uh, several things about Cain. Moses, the author of Genesis, is building expectation for Cain. Notice that he is the firstborn. In Israel religion, the firstborn got a double portion. The firstborn was the one who was to be responsible for the household. He is, Cain is the firstborn. He is a worker of the ground. That's what Adam was. And then notice verse 2. Eve says, or at the end of verse 1, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. Indeed, every single time a child is born, it is through the help of the Lord. Asher was born with the help of the Lord. But it's not often that this statement is made, that a child is born with the help of the Lord. In fact, it happens approximately five times in the Bible. And the purpose here is great expectation. The birth of Cain is attributed to God himself. In fact, the name Cain is related to the verb gotten. So most of your Bibles have a footnote, and the footnote will say Cain sounds like the Hebrew word for gotten. So with Cain, there's lots of expectation. Firstborn, he has his daddy's job, and he's gotten with the help of the Lord. Notice Abel. 
in verse 2. It just says, and she bore Abel his brother. Notice that Abel is described in reference to Cain. Again, the focus is on Cain. And notice about Abel. Nothing is said about him regarding his birth. (laughs) Was it with the help of the Lord? Of course. But Moses doesn't tell you that. And then it says, and now Abel was a sheep of the keep. All right, sheep of the keep. (laughs) Wow. That was, what was that, dyslexic? I don't even know. I'm excited. Now Abel was a keeper of the sheep. That's all we know about Abel. And Cain, a worker of the ground. So the first thing we see, what is Moses doing? Is he's giving you expectation. Expect something from Cain. That's what we should expect. This is the one that uh, God has helped Eve get. Perhaps Eve is expecting this to be the Genesis 3.15 child. Remember in Genesis 3.15, we learned that who's going to reverse the curse? It is an offspring of the woman. Perhaps Eve has great expectation because she's expecting Cain, the firstborn, to be the one who reverses the curse. So we're introduced to these sons, and then we're introduced to a sacrifice. And it's unclear about when this sacrifice happens. It's just, basically, we know it's just the time for a sacrifice. We know nothing else. It's the end of days. What does the end of days mean? Your guess is as good as mine. All we know is it's a time for sacrifice. But notice Cain's offering. It says about Cain that he brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. He just brought an offering. He just brought some fruit from the ground. That's it. But notice Abel. Abel brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. So with regard to the sacrifice, we immediately see that Cain's sacrifice is bland. There's nothing descriptive about it. But Abel's is is portrayed as the ideal sacrifice. When you're in Israel, you offer the firstborn and the fat portions. Because anybody who likes steak, what kind of steaks do you like? You like ribeye. You like steak with fat. Because fat gives the flavor. Well, in the ancient Near East, in Israel, all the fat went to God. Because it was the best part of the sacrifice. So we have here, Abel's sacrifice is ideal. And Cain's, Cain's is not. And how does God respond to these sacrifices? We see that God has regard for Abel, but not for Cain's sacrifice. So Cain becomes angry and his face falls. That takes us to the next main transition in our story. We see in verses 6 through 7, God's compassion. And that's what we're going to focus on really for the rest of the sermon The rest of this narrative functions to compare Cain's character to God's character. And they foil one another. Namely, God's character highlights something in Cain. And Cain's character highlights something in God. So let's learn what that is. So we learn in verse 6 and 7 about God's character. God is kind. Let's read verses 6 through 7. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching out the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. Notice how compassionate God is. Cain has just offered a lackluster sacrifice, to say the least. And what does God do? God goes and instructs him. How kind. God goes to Cain, who has not done well, this passage says, and he instructs him. And what is the instruction? Notice that it is serious. If you do well, you will be accepted. That's a serious thing. You want to be accepted by God. But notice, if you do not do well, notice what it says, sin is crouching at the door. This is an image of a lion. Cain, beware. If you continue not to do well, you will be devoured. Sin crouches in secret. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. Cain is in a dangerous, dangerous place. Sin seeks to rule over Cain. That is dangerous because remember in Genesis 1, 26 through 8, humans are to have dominion over everything, 
including their desires. And Cain here is on the verge of having his desires rule over him. This is serious. God comes to Cain in compassion and mercy and says, Cain, be human. Rule over your desires. Do not let them rule over you. So in, when, as Moses compares and contrasts God's character and Cain's, the first thing we see is God's compassion to come to a sinner when they're in desperate need because he's in danger. Oh, God's compassion. And then in verse 8, we see Cain's character. Let's read verse 8. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Notice that Cain does not rule over his desires, but notice that the desire rules over him. This is what sin does. Every time we give ourselves to sin, we are giving ourselves over to something that will master us. And notice the nature of sin again. It was just like Adam and Eve. Remember Adam, Eve, Eve saw, she took, she ate, she gave. Quick succession of events. Same thing here. Cain speaks, Cain rises up, Cain kills. That's what sin does. It takes over you, and it leads you quickly into its grips. That is the nature of sin. It's quick. It deceives you. And notice something so important here, guys. Cain is giving himself over to sin. He's allowing sin to master him. And notice what he has done. So far, he has deceived. And he has murdered. Turn to John chapter 8, verse 44. And if you just keep your finger in John chapter 8, we're going to reference this a few times. But in John chapter 8, verse 44, we learn something very significant. John says to us, You are of your father, speaking to Pharisees. You are of your father, uh, the devil, and your will, O oh Pharisees, is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character for he is a liar and the father of all lies. The snake is a murderer and we'll learn in Revelation twelve nine that he is a deceiver. What has Cain just done? Cain has just deceived. He speaks to Abel as if in innocence, come with me into a field. Come, come with me. He's deceiving. And then he murders. What is Moses telling us? You give yourself to sin, you become like the snake. You give yourself to sin, you become like the snake. That's what's being said here. The snake is the deceiver and the murderer. And Cain is falling right in line. And then we see a second uh, comparison. So in verses 9 through 16, Moses now again compares God's character to Cain's character. Again, to highlight the compassion and mercy of God to sinners and to highlight that Cain is of the snake. He is of the snake. He is snake. So let's read again verse 9 through 16. Or not again, but for the first time. Verses 9 through 16. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel your brother? He said, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground, and now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand when you work the ground. It shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment, it's greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me today from the ground, and from your face I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. And the Lord said to him, Not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any who found him should attack him. And Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. 
Again, Moses is constructing this true narrative in order to compare God's character to Cain's character. Notice that what we see in God's character is, again, his mercy. The first thing he does is he confronts Cain. How merciful. Let's think of the options here. God could have just let Cain go and given him over to the evilness of his heart. God could have just said or just done to Cain, cold shoulder, far from my presence. He could have ignored the situation and given Cain over to the uncertainty and the eternal conflict of knowing he did wrong, but he didn't have clarity about it. Some of you know what I'm talking about, that you know what you did was wrong, and yet you're in angst. God is compassionate. He comes to Cain, and he makes it clear what he did. He is compassionate. He judges him. That is compassion in the sense that he tells Cain what's right. You have done wrong. But notice what God doesn't do. He doesn't strike him dead. God could have done that. He does that in other parts in the scripture. Genesis 8, 21, God strikes somebody dead. 2 Samuel 6, 7, God is the subject striking people dead. You remember you, uh, Uzzah, the guy who's pushing the cart, the, the wagon of God, and the ark of God falls, and he puts his hands out, and he is struck dead by God. God could have done that. He could have just struck Cain dead right then and there, but he doesn't. He doesn't give him the cold shoulder, and he doesn't bring down the totality of judgment to him. Rather, he does something very different. He asks Cain a question. Isn't that what God did with Adam and Eve? Where are you, Adam? That is God's character. So let's just think for a moment. What Cain meant for evil the killing of Abel, what the snake meant for evil, God intends for good because he's giving the universe a picture of his unexpected grace. When you and I sin against God, he is not quick to banish us. He is not quick to slay us. He comes to us and asks us a question. The compassion of our God. What an opportunity. The compassion of God. Would you have expected this? If sin was not in the picture, would you have expected a universe where if you did sin, God would have done this? No. You had no inclination that God would be this kind of God from Genesis 1. But because of sin enters the picture, we see the totality of God's compassion and goodness and mercy. And don't we rejoice? Don't we savor? Don't we enjoy what the snake meant for evil? God intends for good. But notice what Cain does. In verse 9, he lies. He says, I don't know. He lies. What did we learn about the snake in John 8, 44? He's the liar. Again, Cain is like the snake. The snake is a liar, a deceiver, a murderer, and Cain is a liar, a deceiver, and a murderer. This is intentional. Cain is saying, God is saying, Cain your daddy's the snake. You are of the snake. Cain lies. I do not know. And then he deceives with such tragic words. He deceived Abel, and he, and he spoke to Abel, and he deceives God. He tries to deceive God. He says in verse 9, am I my brother's keeper? What deceptive, snaky words. Am I my brother's keeper, he says. Yes, Cain, you are. You are your brother's keeper. What did we learn in Genesis? That humans are to use everything they have for the good of others. They're to use everything they have to protect God's creation. They're not to use their strength. This is the older brother using his influence to murder his brother. That's not what it means to be human. Cain, you are your brother's keeper. You snaky liar. So we see here a lie and deceptive words, tragic words. So let's think for a moment what has just happened. I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? Notice what sin does to us. Just like we talked about last week in Genesis 3, sin does not affect just peripheral parts of who we are. 
just the outsides. It strikes to the core of who you are. Sin causes Cain to reject what it means to be human. I'm not my brother's keeper. That's what it means to be human. Sin attacks the core of who you are. It messes with your identity. It confuses you. It leads you astray to be somebody you were never meant to be. It leads you astray to do things you were never meant to do. And when you are somebody you were never meant to be, and when you do things you were never meant to do, there is no joy. There is no joy at all. The tragedy of sin. So the application is very clear. Brother and sister, do not treat sin lightly. You might think it's small. I can keep it contained. You can't. You can't. What is Moses doing to us in the storyline of Scripture? It started with eating a piece of fruit. That seems small. Eat a piece of fruit. I tell my son often, don't eat two crackers. He eats two crackers. Well, that's a lot smaller than him hitting his sister, right? Well, that's what sin does. It starts small. And it grows to murder. It starts with my son eating two crackers. And if I don't correct it, it leads to him hitting his sister. And if I don't correct that, it leads to him hitting others. If I don't correct that, it leads him to murdering. That's what sin does. So the application is so clear. Don't treat sin lightly. No matter how small you think it is, oh, it's just a little lie. Oh, it's just, it's just a little flirtatious act. It's just a little bit of porn. Don't treat any of it lightly. It grows. It's its DNA. We talked last week. What is the DNA of sin? The DNA of sin is autonomy. Saying to God, I'm my own God. I don't need you. I have independence from you. And I will do what I want to do. Well, the declaration of independence from God will manifest itself in small things and big things. But the evilness of it isn't just in what it manifests itself in. The evilness of sin is what it is. It's a declaration to God that I don't need you, and that's evil, and don't be deceived. That will manifest itself in big, big things. It will not be content with small things. You see the trick of sin? Remember this, brothers and sisters. The trick of sin is to say you can be independent. And in a sense, that is true. You can be independent from God and do what you want to do to an extent. But what's behind it is And you'll be dependent on me. The reaching for independence from God is dependence on the snake. He doesn't tell you that. He didn't tell us that in Genesis 3. Adam and Eve, you can be independent from God and do what you want to do. He didn't say, but guess what? You're going to be subdued by a snake. He didn't tell you that. But that's what sin does. So the application is so clear. Brother and sister, do not treat sin light it will devour you for that is its dna and notice how god responds so remember the construction of this narrative is the main purpose is to compare god's nature to cain's nature we're seeing the awfulness of cain's nature as he forsakes his humanity and submits himself to the rule of sin we see that he becomes like the snake but again but we see god's character which is so amazing we saw compassion he instructs Cain. He asks Cain a question. And now we see his character, his justice. He curses Cain. Notice in verse 10 what God does. He, God's had enough of it. He says, what have you done? He knows. That tells us God's omniscient. This didn't take God off guard. God knew exactly what was happening the entire time. He's fed up. Okay, okay Cain, stop. What have you done? I know what you've done. You, you, all, you killed him. Tell me. So what does he say? He says, what have you done? And notice how graphic this is. This is poetic. How graphic the language is. In verse 10, he says, this is God speaking. He says, the voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. Blood, having a voice, that's figurative. And that's graphic. And it's crying. It's not just speaking, it's crying, it's screaming from the ground to God. When a biblical author goes 
transitions from narrative to poetry. It's on purpose to indicate something significant. This was a significant act of rebellion. His blood is crying to God. And guess what? God hears it. That is a major theme we see in Scripture. God hears when those who've been mistreated call out to God. So do not mistreat others. That's what Cain's doing. He's using his strength to do what he wants to do. Don't do it. Don't be that kind of leader. When your child hasn't slept in four days and you're tempted to use your strength to silence them, don't do it. That's of the snake. When you're a boss and you're tempted to use your your strength to silence those who are under you, don't do it. That's of the snake. When you're tempted to use your position and authority to get what you want, more money, more sex, whatever it is, don't do it. That's of the snake. Don't do it. So we have this graphic picture that justice will be done. And indeed, that's what we get in verse 11. The verdict comes down. You are cursed. Now, this is so significant, brothers and sisters. You are cursed. Notice back in Genesis chapter 3 when God gives the consequences for the sin. Notice that the only person that's cursed is the snake. Now, it's true that Adam and Eve were cursed because they ate the fruit of the tree. They were. It's easy. Just type into a a Bible software like Bible Gateway. Type in Bible Gateway and just type in cursed. And it will bring up every occurrence of the word cursed in whatever English Bible you want to. And you'll see a lot of verses that say um, you're cursed when you sin. They are cursed. But Moses doesn't explicitly say you're cursed. Why? Because he wants to draw a connection. Because in verse chapter 4, verse 11, he says to, to Cain, you are cursed. The exact same phrase we learn in chapter 3, verse 14, where it says, because you have done this, cursed are you. Cursed are you. Cursed are you. Again, the connection is the snake is cursed. The snake is a liar. The snake is a deceiver. The snake is a murderer. Cain, you're a liar. You're a deceiver. You're a murderer. You are cursed. What's being said? Cain is of the snake. Cain is snaky. That's what sin does. It takes you who are meant, and me, who are meant to reflect God, and we start reflecting the snake, the tragedy. Like, just let's meditate on that for a moment. We who are meant to spread God's glory by reflecting him are spreading the image of snake and its tragedy. It's not glory. A world of using your power to exalt yourself is not glorious. That's abusive. That's tragedy. And that's what sin does to us. So you are cursed. God is just. And notice again the implications of the curse. It's not for peripheral things. It's not like Cain says, you're going to be cursed, you're going to get ingrown fingernails. That's not what he's saying here. It's not just like something that, oh, I could deal with that. Sin causes us to be cursed at the core. Notice verse 11. And now you are cursed from the ground. That was his vocation. That was his job. He loses his job. It says, The ground that opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand, when you work it, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. And he was made to be in community. But notice what happens. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the ground. The consequence of sin will always hit you at the heart of who you are and at the heart of what you do. We need to know that. Again, sin will make you into somebody you were never meant to be. It will make you do things you were never meant to do. And it will be a life of joyless wandering from God's face. That is what sin does. This is tragedy. And Cain gets it. Because this is the first time we hear Cain speak. It says in verse 5 that he spoke to Abel, but we're not told what he says. Intentional. And God instructs Cain, but Cain doesn't respond. Intentional. This is the first time we hear him speak. Why? Because he understands the burden of sin. What does he say? He's afraid in verse 13. He says, my punishment is greater than I can bear. This is desperation. Do you hear the tone? Look at the word choice. 
My punishment is greater than I can bear. You can hear the anxiety. Behold, you have, why is it greater than I can bear? Because you have driven me away from the ground, my job, and from your face I shall be hidden, my identity. Cain gets it. He gets that the burden of sin frustrates his identity and his vocation. It makes him something he was never meant to be. He is now a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds him shall kill him. It wasn't meant to be that way. Death is something that, death is a parasite attached to you. It's not human. What it means to be human is to live forever. Cain is losing it, and he is afraid. But notice God's compassion. God could have said, you're right, Cain. Neener, neener, neener. He could have said, you're right, Cain. Now go away, you lousy, fearful thing. What does he do in verse 15? Notice the compassion of God. For a second, put yourself in Cain's shoes because all, we all have been there, Right? We've all been lost. Every Christian in this room was one time in the kingdom of darkness, Colossians says. You were there, and notice what God does. In verse 15, then the Lord said to him, not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken sevenfold. God protects Cain. That is unexpected. You have a child of the devil that God has pursued, and that God has shown compassion to, and now God will protect that person. The amazing character of our God. He protects Cain. But there's still consequences. He must go. And indeed, indeed he goes. So what we've seen in this narrative is we've seen great expectation for Cain. Maybe he's the one. And we've seen tragedy because he gives himself to sin. Sin is war against God's kingdom. And don't treat any of it lightly. It's very, very serious. It turns you into a snake. But notice a genealogy happens. And uh, this takes us from verse 17 all the way down through chapter 5. And I'm just going to kind of narrate a few points here. So in Genesis 4 to 5, we have a genealogy. And genealogies are so significant. Do not skip the genealogy. I know I'm giving less time, but I'm not skipping it. So why are genealogies significant? For one reason, because it proves the trustworthiness of God. God said, if you sin, you'll die. And the snake said, no, you won't. But what does the genealogy prove? And he died, and he died, and he died, and he died. So if we had a drummer, and my wife plays the drums, and there was like a little drum beat in the background of our songs, the drum beat in the back of this song is, God is true, God is true, God is true, God is true, God is true. Snake's a liar, snake's a liar, snake's a liar, snake's a liar. That is the constant beat of these genealogies. So they're very significant. Also, genealogies have a common pattern. So-and-so lived, so-and-so fathered, so-and-so lived, so-and-so died. That's the pattern of a genealogy. They could be abbreviated and they could be expanded, but that's the pattern. So when a, the pattern's broken, it's super, super significant. Like a country song. In a country song, what happens in every country song? A guy loses his family, he loses his dog, and he's drinking a bunch. That's a country song. Imagine a country song where he doesn't lose his family or a dog. Your ears perked up. Because that's not normal. So when the genealogy is broken, your ear better perk up. And I like country, so don't see that as a dig on country. I actually love John, country. Josh Turner is my favorite, but that's a footnote. So... When it's broken, you pay attention. So notice that Moses narrates Cain, uh, the genealogy of Cain. And notice that whenever he breaks the pattern, the purpose is often to highlight the sin of this family. Notice in verse 17, Cain knew his wife and she conceived and bore Enoch when he built a city. A city! That's evil. Why? Because Cain was to be a wanderer. And he's already rebelling against God. He's building a city. You were supposed to be a nomad, Cain. You're building a city. You're sinning. And then notice uh, verse 19 through 24, utter tragedy. I'll read these verses for us. And Lamech took two wives. Two wives. The name of the one was Ada, and the name of the other was Zillah. And Ada bore Jabal, who was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. His brother's name was Jubal who was the father of those who played the lyre and the pipe. Zillah and also bore Tubal-Cain, 
He was the forger of all instruments of bronze and iron. The sister of Tubal-Cain was Nama. Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice. You wives of, of Lamech, listen to what I say. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. Cain's vengeance is sevenfold, then Lamech's is seventy-sevenfold. The awfulness of sin. Polygamy, that's not the way it was meant to be. When Jesus makes a comment on Genesis chapter 2, he says the two shall become one flesh. That is the paradigm. This is not the paradigm. Polygamy, two wives. And then notice child abuse. Notice verse 23. Notice, Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice, you wives of Lamech. Listen to what I have said. These are two parallel lines. I have killed a man for wounding me. Now man is parallel to a young man. Lamech kills a boy. Why? For striking him. (laughs) Polygamy, child abuse, this isn't an eye for an eye. Lamech just didn't slap him back. He killed him. And then notice in verse 24, if Cain's vengeance is sevenfold, then Lamech's is seventy-sevenfold. Think of the audacity. Who announced vengeance for Cain? It was God. God said, if anybody strikes you, it's vengeance is mine. But notice that Lamech has the audacity to announce his own vengeance. He is taking the place of God. That's what sin is, remember? What is sin? It's a cosmic role reversal whereby we say, I'm going to be my own God. And that's exactly what Lamech's doing. He is usurping God's role in his life, and he's making vengeance for himself. And he wants to heighten it. The audacity of sin, 77-fold. You don't have the authority, Lamech, to do that. God didn't announce that. You're, You're announcing that yourself. Think about how evil this is. So, in this genealogy, when Moses breaks the pattern, it highlights the evilness of Cain's family. That's what mainly what's happening here. But notice the end of Genesis 4, and I want to jump with joy. Oh my goodness. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and called his name Seth. For she said, God has appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel, for Cain killed him. To Seth also a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. At that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. Yes, I want to jump so high right now, because this is amazing. Two things make this so amazing. Oh, man, I'm so excited. Stick with me, guys. Okay, his name is Seth. Do you have a footnote in your Bible here? What does Seth mean? I don't have a footnote in my Bible. It means to a point. And when you look back at Genesis 3.15, I will put, same verb, I will put. It's the only time those two words have happened in the Bible so far. I am going to put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. And now God is putting. Seth is the appointed one. And then notice that he is, what is he called? An offspring. Look at this. Let's see. God has appointed for me another offspring. Notice that so far, Eve's children are called sons. But let's go back to Genesis 3.15. I will appoint enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and between her offspring. What's Moses doing? He's saying, Genesis 3.15, Seth. Appoint, appoint, offspring, offspring. What is the significance of this? The significance of this is this, and I'm getting so excited. We just saw wickedness, but notice that God has the last word. Notice how this chapter, and in Judaism, this would be the end of the daily reading, ends with verse 25 through 26. And the end of that daily reading makes clear that God has the last word. Despite sin, despite the wickedness of Cain, there is an appointed one, and Cain was never meant to be it. It is Seth. Seth is the appointed offspring. Through him, salvation will come. God always has the last word. What what the snake means for evil. What Cain meant for evil. God means for good. Because notice that when the appointed offspring, who is Seth, 
Not ultimately Seth, but it's going to come through Seth. Notice what happens when that person comes. To Seth also a son was born and he called his name Enosh. At that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. When the appointed offspring comes, we call on God's name. And without that offspring, you ain't calling on God. That's not what happens. Without the offspring, without Jesus, you and me are just like Cain. But when God sends that ultimate offspring, who reverses the curse, who is Jesus himself, we call upon the name of the Lord. And God's kingdom is firmly established. And his goal of spreading his glory everywhere is triumphant despite sin. What Satan and you and me mean for evil, God intends for good. God gets the last word. How amazing. We could have started singing right now, but I would be an awful leader. Of, come on, Brenda, no. We should start singing. That's so amazing. Okay, but we can't end there because Gen- I have to get through Genesis 22 by the week before Easter. That's why we're covering so much at one time. I really could do this in one sermon, but we're not going to. So let's think about Genesis 5. Here we have the genealogy of, of Eve. And it's through Seth. And notice that the genealogical pattern of he lived, he fathered, he died, is also broken. It's broken two times. But the purpose of giving you added details is not to highlight the evilness of Cain. It's to show you the godliness of Seth's line. The first time it breaks is in Enoch with Enoch. Verse 21, chapter 5, verse 21. When Enoch had lived 65 years, he fathered Methuselah. Enoch walked with God after he had fathered Methuselah 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Enoch were 365. Enoch walked with God and was not, for God took him. We learn two times at the very beginning of uh, of Enoch, the very beginning of the description and the very end. That's important. Moses is framing When he tells you something at the beginning and he repeats it at the end, he's saying, hey, this needs to guide how you interpret what comes between. What does he tell us here? He says, Enoch walked with God. And then in verse 24, Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. I got this from some commentator, I can't remember who it is, but he said, this verse tells us that the chains of death are reversed by walking with God. Enoch didn't die. That's the curse. Why not? Because he walked with God. What a beautiful theological truth. Walk with God and death is gone. Isn't that right? You will die in this earth indeed. But if you walk with God, if you're with Jesus, this offspring, if you're identified with the offspring by trusting in Jesus, then death is not the final word. You will be with God. That is how you reverse the curse. Walk with God. That's what's said here. And then the next time the genealogical pattern is broken is when Moses describes Noah. And he tells us in verse 28, when Lamech, a different Lamech, had lived 182 years, he fathered a son and called his name Noah, saying, out of the ground that the Lord has cursed, this one shall bring us relief from our work and from the painful toil of our hands. Lamech lived after he fathered Noah 595 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Lamech were 777 years, and he died. After Noah was 500 years old, Noah fathered Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Noah, the hope and the anticipation with Noah. We'll talk about him next week. Super excited. Uh, The hope and the anticipation with Noah is that he will alleviate part of the curse and indeed he does noah is a picture of jesus in so many ways and we'll talk about that next week but notice that he is to alleviate the painful toil of our hands let me look at my notes real quick labor is not a part of the curse we are to work but toilsome labor is a part of the curse this word for toilsome labor only appears well thus far in the narrative appears twice It characterizes Eve's labor in childbirth, which is now toilsome, and Adam's labor in farming, which is now toilsome. What does Noah do? He reverses, to an extent, 
the toilsomeness of the curse. So we're going to talk about that a lot next week. So I can't give you much about it. So come back next week. Um, and, you, and if you stop, we might not record the sermon properly like last week. So you better come next week. But the point I want to make right now is simple. When the genealogical pattern of he lived, he fathered, he died is broken with Seth's line, the point is to show you that there is hope. That there is a lot of hope despite sin. Where's that hope? That hope is found in that offspring who is promised. And Enoch is a picture of that offspring, but not ultimately. And Noah is a picture of that offspring, but not ultimately. What we're seeing happening in the Old Testament is we get all these pictures of the long-awaited for coming one. And when we read Matthew 1 and 2, he's here. That's what's going on in these passages. Therefore, Moses provides for us a glimpse into the nature of the war between the kingdoms in Genesis 4 and 5. Those who war against God, who have not surrendered to Jesus' lordship, are of the snake. That's very clear. Back in Genesis 8, 44, Jesus says to the Pharisees, your father is the devil. That's what it says. And then in 1 John 3, 12, if you write that down, 1 John 3, 12, John says, if you don't love your brothers, you, your father is the devil. So sin, if you give yourself over to sin, you are identifying into the family of the devil. That's what war against God's kingdom is. The second thing we learn about war between the kingdoms, so the first thing was, if you give yourself over to war against God's kingdom, is you're really, you have the devil. The next thing is that God is kind to those enslaved by the devil. We saw God's compassion and kindness in pursuing Cain. So how much more for anybody in this room who's trusted in Jesus? And that's many of you. I know you guys. You trust Jesus, many of you, maybe all of you. How much more will God show compassion and mercy to you? How much more will God pursue you when you sin? How much more will God lavish you with his kindness and his instruction and his love when you sin? Because you're not of the devil anymore. If you've trusted in Jesus, you're no longer in that kingdom. You're in God's kingdom. You're not a child of the devil. You're a child of God. So if God would show that kindness to Cain, God's going to lavish on you so much more kindness. War between the kingdoms is serious. But more serious is God's unstoppable character to show kindness to his people, even those who are enslaved to the devil. So in conclusion, the kingdom of the serpent is all about warring against God's kingdom. When you sin, you're declaring war against God, and that makes you into the snake. So beware. Sin makes you into the snake, but grace, grace makes you godly. Reject the whispers of the snake who says to you, you can be independent from God. Know that beneath it is you will be dependent on me. Reject that. Now, Christian, what do I want from you? Non-Christian, I want you to reject sin and trust Jesus. That's it. Jesus, I trust you. That's what I want you to do today. But Christian, what do you do? See the greatness of sin and run from it. Sin makes you like a snake. Run from it. But more motivating than that, see the awfulness of sin and look up at the cross and see the greatness of our God and run to God. He is there for you, saying, come back to me. Come back to me and find joy in doing what you're meant to do, glorifying God, and being who you are meant to be, a human who has dignity and respect. Let's not trust the word of the snake any longer. Let's trust the word of the Lord. Lord, I am thankful for my brothers and sisters in this room who love you. And God, they love you because you loved them. I love you because you loved me. We are safe because of Christ. So I'm thankful for them. Help them to run from sin this week. Let them do whatever they need to to, to reject ungodliness with all of its deceit. Let them run after godliness with passion. Motivate them by a big picture of you. Let them know who you are as compassionate and gracious and let them enjoy you. Let them 
glorify you. Let them not trust the devil. Let them trust you. And I pray for anybody who does not know you here today, God. Let them come to you today, trusting in your goodness. In Jesus' name, amen.